Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the podcast, The Joyful Frugalista, and now here's your host, Serena Bird. Hello, I'm super excited to share the good news that I have written another book, How to Pay Your Mortgage Off in 10 Years, responds to the cost of living crisis that many people find themselves in. Whether you are paying off a mortgage, you've paid off a mortgage, you aspire to buy a house and have a mortgage, or you know someone who does have a mortgage, this book will have lots of frugal tips and tricks as well as some finance hacks for you. Thank you so much. You my frugalisters and welcome. Today I have a special guest and of course all of my guests are very special. <laughs> but this guest is someone who I've kind of been stalking since 2015 and I, I use that in a generic sense, not in an actual creepy <laughs> sense because I swear I'm not a creepy person. But she's someone who is seriously all around awesome, a respected speaker, mentor, podcaster, and author. In fact, we share the same publisher, which is pretty exciting as well. Go yeah. Major Street. Go Major Street. <laughs> First, I have a favor to ask of you. If you enjoy this podcast and find it useful for you, please pay it forward by sharing with a friend. And even better, please follow the Joyful Frugalista podcast. Kate Toon is an award-winning business mentor and digital marketing coach. Her Stay Tuned group of companies, did I pronounce that right? You did. Oh, good, <laughs> thank you. Include the Digital Marketing Collective, the Clever Copywriting School, and the Recipe for SEO Success. Kate's helped more than 20,000 other businesses. I nearly got a zero wrong. Demystify <laughs> digital marketing, grapple the Google beast, and find their own version of success. She's a renowned speaker, podcaster, and author, and she was named Australia's Most Influential Small Businesswoman 2022, one of Australia's top 50 small business leaders the same year, and Businesswoman of the Year and Training and Education Provider of the Year at the National My Business Awards 2020. She's the author of Six Figures in School Hours, How to Run a Successful Business and Still Be a Good Parent, which came out recently, June, I think you said. June, yeah, end of June. And I've been watching all the book launch events. It's You're just doing fabulously well. I'm just super, super excited to have you on, Kate. Welcome. Oh, thank you so much, Sharina. Seriously, I first heard you speak about SEO at ProBlogger in 2015 and to be honest, at that point, I hadn't actually heard about SEO, but I've certainly heard about it since because I think not a week goes by where I have a spam call or an email threatening to or offering to help offering. me improve my SEO. And I must say, for a fairly technical subject, I didn't expect to find it so engrossing. I was actually really wrapped. It's such an interesting topic. So, like, how did you get into SEO? Well, I started my freelance business when my son was, well, not born. He was still in my tummy. And I was working as a copywriter. But in my previous life in agencies, I'd done SEO work with big brands like Pedigree Charm and American Express. So when I went out on my own, I started as a copywriter. Then I moved into being a, a search engine optimization copywriter, like writing copy for humans and Google. And then from there, I moved into doing little workshops and audits, which then evolved into a course and then a mini course and a tripwire and a podcast and all manner of stuff. But that event that you saw me speaking at in 2015, I just found the picture from that. That was really the beginning of the sort of switch, the pivot. Yes, I used the word pivot from being a, a freelancer who had clients to kind of being a business owner who had products and, serv and services and passive income. That was my first big speaking gig. I think I only spoke for about 10 minutes, but it was a big room, wasn't it? About 500 people there. It was full on. Yeah, um, it was a big room. Mm, and and I, just, I wasn't very confident. I'd not spoken really at anything before. It was like a, I went into like a, a competition to get 10 minutes on the stage and I won with a few other people. And that was the start of a whole new direction for me. So it's a pivotal moment. And you were there. Pretty cool. Well, not only was I there, but I remember thinking, wow, she's so successful. She's so confident. She's so amazing. <laughs> and they were all things that really struck me at the time. Wow, and I didn't know funny. about your other other work and the mm. other things you did. But, you know, whenever I sort of needed SEO advice, I'd always think back to that and some of the key oh, tips. Oh, it worked then. Hurrah. Thank it you, Darren work. Rouse. Thank you, ProBogger. <laughs> <laughs> but back to SEO. So, like, most people don't know what it is. Perhaps you can explain to people what it is. And I should explain too that I've had a few people ask me to help them with their website problem, including recently. And invariably, the problem is it just doesn't come up when they do a Google search. 
Yeah. So SEO stands for search engine optimization, which isn't particularly helpful either. And it has a bit of a dirty name. It has a bit of a black name. And it's because of those emails that we get saying, greetings of the day. We have looked at your website and we can help you get number one ranking. Um, I don't know why SEOs send those. Accountants don't send those. Graphic designers don't send those. It just seems to be search engine optimization people. And I think they prey on the fact that most of us think it's too technical. It's super complicated. It's a dark art. And therefore, we're more likely to be duped. But it's none of those things. It's really, really easy to understand. And the way that I like to explain it is SEO is about making Google fall in love with your website. And the analogy I use, Serena, is The Bachelor. Have you ever watched The Bachelor? It's awful, but I bet you have. I, I have, not so yeah. many, but those not roses. Many. I remember. Oh, the, the roses. roses. Well, Google gives out roses, basically. So there's 30 websites standing in a room and Google comes in. And it's going to pick one, right? It's going to pick one. And it already knows what it wants. It has a list of about 200 things that it's looking for in the perfect website. And if you can tick off those things, you can be the chosen one. You can get the rose. The chosen one. <laughs> oh, exactly. So SEO is really just knowing what those 200 things are and knowing which ones are the most important and which are the least important, which are the hard ones, which are the easy ones. Google pretty much tells us most of the things that it wants from us. We just don't listen. And then there are SEO people like me who help translate. I feel of myself like I'm an SEO translator because it's quite difficult to understand when you're new to it. So I try and break it down in a way that makes it enjoyable. And as you said, it's enjoyable. It's some, when you work out how to do it, you can get really good results really quickly. Well, I don't think I've got as great results as <laughs> you, know, you do and other people do. And I must say, I kind of, sometimes as a writer, I find being dictated to by Google Analytics is a bit scary. Like sometimes I want to turn it off because I want to have that creativity. And yeah, I think that's, I think that's super important because I'm a writer too. Yeah. But I think when you really fully understand this, it's not the enemy. It's not about shoving keywords in awkwardly here and there and worrying about click through rates and all of that. It really is about focus and being helpful. So if you're producing a piece of content before you write it, you say to yourself, what's the goal? Do I want someone to buy from this? Do I want someone to just like me? Do I want someone to know me better? Is it an awareness piece, a conversion piece? Not everything you write needs to be written with SEO in mind. You can write whatever you want, but some <laughs> pieces you need to have focus and think, what would someone type into Google to find this article? What would they type in? And if they found my article, would they be satisfied? Is it enough or is it a bit thin, a bit short, a bit dodgy, a bit, you know, I made it in chat GTP. Or is it useful? Oh, you can tell. It? Sometimes you can tell. <laughs> you can tell if you don't do the extra work. So yeah, it's it doesn't need to be. I think some people feel like thinking about SEO is like writing with one hand tied behind your back, but it doesn't need to be. You just need to understand it better and know that it's it's a guide, it's a focus, it's not a rigid structure. I really like that analogy. And actually, I want to share something with you, which is mm -hmm. a number of years ago, I was being commissioned to write articles on recipes. And it was in the middle of our bushfires. We had three days of 40 degree weather here in Canberra. And I was being told to have, write a recipe on a baked cheesy macaroni. And I'm like, are you nuts? Like we're in the middle of extreme heat wave and you want me to tell people to turn on your oven and what it was is because the google keywords were trending for macaroni and cheese right. but there's also a blizzard that was happening in northern us so like to what extent do we have to look at those keywords and be really aware of them and to what extent do we have to sort of turn them off well it depends again it depends what your goal is so the first goal of seo is to be found for your own brand brand, right? So for me, it would be like recipe for SEO success or clever copywriting school or your own name. So you as an author would want to be able to be found for Serena Bird. That's the first goal. And that's pretty easy to achieve because you have an about page, which you mention your own name on. You obviously also got, maybe got your name on your LinkedIn profile, on your Instagram. All of those are just saying to Google, this is Serena Bird. She is an author. She is a joyful free grilliser. And we have a digital footprint. So every time you're mentioned along with your brand name, Google goes, ah, Ah, and every time it's giving you another point, <laughs> building up that profile, right? So that's the first goal. And then after we've been found for who we are, the next goal is to be found for what we do. And that's when it gets a bit harder. And in that arena, there's really two types of keywords we need to think about. Conversion keywords. I want to buy something. I want to give you money. 
So for me, it might be like SEO template for e-commerce or something, or like SEO course or something like that. Buy affordable SEO course, cheap Austra- SEO course Australia. Very competitive, difficult to rank for because someone who types that in knows exactly what they want and they're very likely to buy if you give them what they want. A little bit further back is the other type of keyword, which we call informational keywords. They're for people who maybe aren't quite ready to buy. They're just kind of thinking about it. So with you, it might be like tips to save money in the kitchen, you know, or tips to save money. How can I pay my home loan off faster? They're not looking to buy a book or join your community. They're just in the top level. They're just in the problem zone. But you could lure them from that beautiful blog post to your products and services. You see what I mean? You become someone that they trust and they know. So there's really two types of keywords that you need to think about. Can you switch them off and not worry about them? I think you always need to write with a focus. Do you need to spend 16 hours researching the keyword and find out that this one's 1% better than that one? No. <laughs> often, you can use your com- often you can use your common sense. You know the common questions your audience is asking because you get asked them all the blooming time, right? So they just become your blog post titles and you write a good article answering that question and you'll probably have a pretty good chance of, of ranking for it. So yeah, I mean... Keyword re- research is, is worthwhile, can make a big difference, but it's hard and it's complicated sometimes. And you can do a lot of research and then come out the other end and go, yeah, I'm just going to go with the one I thought. <laughs> was one. Oh, I love that. And actually, that reminds me of, I guess, one of the big aha moments that I had from your book, and it's fairly early in this, and this is your book, Six Figures in School Hours. And you talk about Britney Spears and her (laughs) song that she's known for. So, uh, you know, perhaps if you could just explain to my listeners. Oh, I love this. Yeah, poor Britney. Um, I love, I love Britney. And I guess my analogy there is, especially as a personal brand or, or, or as an author or a podcaster or a coach, you need to be known for who you are. And it takes people a long time to get who you are and what you do. So you need to be willing to sing the same song for a very long time, almost to the point when you're sick of it. So poor Britney Spears gets up on stage and she's singing all her new material. And of course, someone in the audience starts up the chant for Hit Me Baby One More Time. And inside, (laughs) she probably dies a little and goes, I don't want to sing that again. That song is 20 years old, but it's what she's known for. And I've had this problem because I was a copywriter. And I really wanted to become known for SEO. So I worked really hard at it. Pro Blogger was one of those things. Now I don't do just SEO. I'm a digital marketing coach. I teach people automation and lead magnets and funnels. And I wrote a book about business and parenting. And in a way, I want to not have to sing Hit Me Baby (laughs) One More Time. I sang it too long and too well that people cannot forget that about me. It's fine because I still offer that, but it's hard then to evolve. It's like Madonna, you know, when she stopped being. 80s Madonna and she wanted to be disco Madonna, people were annoyed. They're like, hang on, no, we like 80s Madonna. You can't be disco Madonna. She's the queen of reinvention, right? So it's it's about being known for one thing. And just as you think, oh my God, I cannot mention my book one more time. They must have heard of it by now. They must be so sick of it. Someone will go, oh, Serena, you wrote a book. And you're like, what? I've sent you 20 emails. How do you not know? But that's the point when people start to get it is usually the point when people give up and unfortunately have to keep on going. We know this with books. I think I said to uh, Eleanor, uh, our publicist at uh, Major Street, how much, how much longer do I need to talk about the book for? And she said like, Kate, it's been five weeks. And I'm like, yeah. Like how much longer? <laughs> oh, a lot like, longer. A year, like a year maybe. I'm like, oh my God, really? So I've had my Britney Spears moment, believe me. <laughs> yeah, well, the amount of times I've written things on how to save money at the supermarket and why you need yes. a shopping list. And you think, really? Like people don't get this, but actually for I a lot don't. of people, this is new. Like a lot of people struggle with this is a common issue. And, you know, supermarkets yeah. spend, spend millions of dollars on marketing to work out how to, to optimise. To mess and, with us, to mess with us. But the other yeah. thing, people need to hear things multiple times. I mean, I, I teach like you teach. And with SEO, I've noticed that it can take six, seven times repeating the same thing and coming at it from different angles. So you've watched a video, you've read a transcript, you've seen me do a demo, you've asked me some questions, you've read the FAQs, then you watch the video again, then it clicks. Yes. You know, then it clicks. So the number of times I've read about taking a shopping list uh, and not going when you're hungry and, you know, shopping at Aldi, maybe not Woolies. 
but I still shop at Woolies when I'm hungry without a shopping list. <laughs> you know, we need to be told it again and again and again because we're essentially very stupid people. I think at the base. <laughs> well, I am. Well, I, I I don't I don't know. I think we just have different motivators and, and yes. other things. But but back to your book, and I was not expecting such an honest discussion about parenting. And mm. I must say that I was reading the chapter on parenting and your own different values and how you experiment with independence versus being more kind of um, rule driven, uh, more rule driven mother henish. Mm. During a week where I was sort of having a, what I call bad mother syndrome, like hashtag yes. bad mother oh. syndrome. With my kids, and when they were young, they didn't understand this, and they just laugh and say, "Bad mother Cinderella." So I knew we were actually okay. But um, just to share, as I was reading your book, and you're talking about how you sort of gradually give more independence to your kids and how that relates to your business, I was in Sydney. My youngest was competing at the table tennis nationals. He's only was only ten then, and he came back on an e scooter by himself, which is a couple of kilometres fell off his e-scooter, grazed his knees really badly, had blood everywhere, random parents stopping and helping him. And, gee, that was a bit of a parental fail moment. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and you feel like the worst parent. You can't, the thing is you can't win. If you hadn't done that and he'd have come home, you know, the, the sod's law that that happened on the one time that you let him be brave, you know, and we've all got stories like that. You know, there's, I, I could tell you some pretty bad stories about myself, and it's such a fine line and especially the thing I find really hard is like you know maybe my, I've said to my son can you make fish fingers because I've got a zoom call or something and then he blooming burns himself or something on the oven and I'm like I am the worst parent my son got burned because of the zoom call and then you, you what you do is you make your business conflict with your family it becomes the enemy and that's really problematic because then we always feel bad when we're working we always feel bad about our work they're, they're the enemy and we always feel we should be with the family. And it's it's really hard. I mean, in the book, I, there's a matrix, which isn't mine. It's Diana Baumrin's. And it's the matrix of permissiveness and responsiveness. So if you're super permissive, that's kind of a permissive parent. You can be super authoritarian and have loads of rules, but you don't really listen to your kid's opinion. And when I did that chapter, I was like, oh, my God, who am I? Because I'd never <laughs> thought about parenting in that way. And I was like, you're a little bit of both, a little bit of all four. Like on a Monday, I might be permissive, but by Tuesday, I'm an authoritarian. Then Wednesday, I'm a helicopter mum. And by Friday, I don't give a crap. It's, <laughs> you know, it changes throughout the week. And I think that chapter is called What is a Good Parent? And at the end of the chapter, you realize there's no such thing. But what is important is to sit down and think about what's important to you in your parenting style. You know, what's on your list and what, how does that come into conflict with your business? So one example is I always like to read, I used to like to read to my son and that meant I couldn't do the 6 p.m. Zooms, right? I couldn't Zoom with anybody at 6 p.m. In, like, so therefore I can't have an audience in the UK because that's when they want me to do Zooms. So that's the, comp I can't have both. I can't be 6 p.m. Zooming and reading to my son or I could do one Zoom a week. And that kind of read to my son every other night and he's not going to explode because I miss one night. So it's about finding the conflicts and working out a solution rather than ignoring the conflicts and just feeling like you're torn in two all the time. Yeah, that's a really good way of putting it. And I must say, like when I wrote my first book, The Joyful Frigalista, I had a lot of internal conflict about, oh, the time away I spent from my family to write the book. And when the book arrived, I actually was there with my kids when the box arrived and I asked them to open it and they were so excited for me and they had no idea whatsoever that I've been writing a book. And I was like, didn't you notice me taking time away to do this? No, nah, they didn't notice whatsoever. What? There was no trauma there whatsoever. No, I mean, and I, you know, I had a period about, about 2017, I spoke at a lot of events and I still feel guilty about that now. But I talked to my son about it and he's like, I can't even remember. I was like <laughs> eight. Like, what are you talking? I don't even remember like two years ago. We we beat ourselves up. And I don't think it's necessarily our children that make us feel guilty because they're oblivious most of the time. It's society. It's other mums, other dads. It's our parents and how we were brought up. The pressure that we put on ourselves because we all have such high expectations of ourselves. We're very cruel to ourselves and we set ourselves very unrealistic expectations. And then beat ourselves up when we fail to meet them. And no one else notices generally and no one else cares. It's crazy. There's a whole chapter in the book about parent guilt and how to kind of mitigate it. I don't think it ever goes away, but I do think you can find your triggers and, and mitigate it a little bit. 
Yeah, I had a mother who had a business and I think that helps because yes. I, re- I remember the times we, I, we went to school and she forgot to give us lunches and then, you know, yeah. we made our own lunches and then, you know, at the time she forgot excursion money and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, and, and you so survived. You survived and yeah. it's fine. And, you know, we were always very proud of her. She did really well in yeah. her business. She was a, a fashion designer. And so wow. I think the fact she could actually succeed in, in that way was actually a huge role. It was, Massively it, it was an example for me. You know, yeah, but that, I didn't feel that there were things that I couldn't do that I could just do. So, like, I sort of take that into context too. Yeah, and I think this is what we need to remember, you know, whether you're working in a, a, a real job, as I would call it, or you're working at home, working part-time, full-time, whatever, you are providing your child with different examples of what life can look like. I work at home in my pajamas, and when my son was little, he was like, well, you don't have a real job, you're not like that one. I was like, no, 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 you see that policewoman? She has, <laughs> she has a job. But she wears an outfit. See, you know, that doctor, she has a job and she works in a medical center. I have a job and I work at home in my pajamas, but we're all doing the same thing. We're all providing from our families, doing something we enjoy that gives us a sense of self-worth, which is important. We're allowed to actualize ourselves and be more than just parents. I think giving your kids different examples of that is really important. So they don't think the only way to succeed is to get an office job. Yeah, that's a big one because a lot of those traditional office jobs are going. They I mean, won't I'm, exist. Yeah. I'm, I'm in Canberra where so many people are in the Commonwealth Public Service and even those roles are changing now. Yeah, they say, don't they, something like in, in 10 years' time, 50% of the jobs that we have now won't exist and this is all the STEM stuff that we're looking at. And so I think we're just incredibly hard on ourselves as parents. And, and part of that is innate. If we didn't care... Our kids would be outside the cave being eaten by a mammoth. Do you know what I mean? It's part, it's intrinsically why we're parents, but we can take it a bit too far and use it as a stick to beat ourselves with. And, and that's when I think burnout can happen and, and anxiety and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, most definitely. So yeah. also early in your book, and I swear I did get along and, <laughs> and read further, but there's, so there, were, <laughs> there were some things that were really profound. And one was that you talked about your money goals and your mm. reasons for getting to, into business. And you were very clear that it wasn't just about earning a lot of money. And I think this is important because particularly in this sort of startup environment, like so yeah. many people are like, I want to be the next unicorn, but it's <laughs> not necessarily like that for you. No. So my first goal was time. I wanted to have time with my my child. I didn't want to work full time. So time was my first goal. I wanted to be as much of a hands-on mum as I could be, given the fact that I needed to make money and I was the breadwinner. And I think a lot of people leave their full-time job and go, I, I want to match my full-time salary. That's my goal. And I often think, why? You had that full-time salary and what came with that was a commute, having to wear outfits, having to heat up tuna in the office microwave, dealing with a boss working someone else's hours, being someone else's creature, surely there's an economic cost to that that you're willing to take off by the fact that you get to stay at home or whatever it is or start your own business as you want and be captain of your ship. So I think it's really, really important, and this is my frugalista tip, to really think about minimal viable income. You know, really look at what could you survive on? And I'm not talking about the nice stuff. You can have one streaming service, but that's it. Like what is the lowest that you could survive on? That's your first goal, to just get enough to survive. And I think lots of people just put so much pressure on themselves to maintain a certain lifestyle, to have these financial goals without realizing that they've, they've won hugely if they get to have their own business and, and do that. And that comes at a bit of a cost. So I'm big into minimal viable income, both in real life and in business. Oh, look, I really just love that because I see a lot of small business owners, especially new small business owners, especially female owned business, female founders beating themselves up because so much of what they perceive as worth is the dollar sign. And because they're not earning a lot in money, they mm. therefore think that their, their worthiness of a business owner is compromised. But it's not, is it? Not at all. And on the flip of that, there's a whole ream of, of, of coaches and courses and whatever that sell women in particular the idea that we're not enough. And that unless you come on this retreat, join this mastermind, do this course, you are not going to be enough. You're not going to be a real business owner. You have to be having lady lunches and you have to be going on retreats in Malibu to be a real proper (laughs) business owner. And it's just, uh, I will be honest and say for the first seven years of my business, I didn't spend a cent. 
I had a computer and I had internet and that was it. I didn't go to anything. I didn't buy Kiki K stationery. I didn't have a pretty office with a gorgeous background. I just had me and my laptop and the kitchen table. And I was absolutely fine. You don't need all the frippery and the foo-foo. And, I, and this is the other thing, which is tr the truth of business. A lot of business is pretty boring. You know, like it's not having lunches and going to events. It's sitting at your desk and doing the work. It's the Stephen King approach, which comes after the Britney Spears approach. <laughs> of just sitting at your desk and doing the work and, 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 and your business being fairly predictable and fairly dull, maybe 90% of the time. And I think, you know, especially for female founders, Instagram has glamorized business into something that it really isn't. Mm, well said. But I will say you actually have a conference coming up. and I've I do. That's what I've come through, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not a Malibu frou-frou. You'll actually learn stuff at, at your, your conference. Yeah, I'm, I'm very into practical implementation. I do love a, a frou-frou woo-woo conference where you just go and be inspired by like super successful business women. But I also... I think I'd prefer a smaller event where you actually sit down and you go, I can actually do that tomorrow and it's going to make a difference. The people that are on the stage are not mega billionaires. They're just a bit further ahead than you. I find that more inspiring because then it feels doable. We can't all be Beyonce, but we could be as good as that other businesswoman who sat over there. Are you, you know? telling I'm me not... that I don't look like Beyonce? <laughs> well, well, you know, we, I've got the bottom of Beyonce, but that's about it. <laughs> So when and where for your next conference? The Digital Marketing Collective Conference is in Sydney on the 7th of October. Um, but we do have a digital ticket because I do appreciate that lots of people don't want to leave the house anymore. So you can get a digital ticket and get all the recordings uh, sent to you and you can watch them in the comfort of your own home. Ooh, well, it's my birthday and it's my son's birthday uh, the day before. So I've got to try and deconflict and work out what's happening. <laughs> but I must say, it looks really fabulous. Oh, so, thank you. Um, really, really do check that out if there are things that you're interested in. And if you're listening to this, chances are that you are. So you also share in your book, with a lot of humility, I believe, some of your early childhood beliefs around money and then going into your adulthood, your relationship status and, 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 and everything that's happened for you as you became a mother. How did these formative times as a child really influence your thinking about money? Yeah, well, like, you know, like you're talking about your mum. Uh, my dad started his own business when I was about seven. My parents are English and they're Northern English. And, you know, the whole thing is never borrow money, never borrow money, no credit cards, save up for stuff, work hard, all of which I, I believe in, but I also think is not also necessarily true. You can borrow money in a an intelligent way. You don't have to work that goddamn hard. So yeah, obviously very influenced by my mom and dad. My dad's business, eventually there was a recession and it closed and that caused some stress on our, our family, but he recovered. He got another job. And then as a 20 year I think you either go one way or the other. Like if your parents are quite strict on money, you become very strict or you become very frivolous. And unfortunately, I went down the frivolous route, Serena. So in my 20s, I spent beyond my means. I had rich friends who were older than me and I tried to keep up with them. So I got in debt then, then I recovered. And then when I started my business, I did all the things I just told you not to. I bought the, <laughs> you know, I, I, I didn't spend a lot of money, but I didn't keep track of my money. And so I didn't save very well for tax. I didn't seem, I didn't really understand tax. So I just ignored it. I didn't really notice when I went over the GST threshold and that was a bit painful having to pay that back when I hadn't charged it. Oh, ouch. Ouch. And, um, you know, just had a year where I made a fair bit of money. But I was just like, whoop, whoop. And I spent it without going, oh, yeah, not all of that's mine, is it? I have to give some back to the government. So, you know, I, I did get in about, I think I had about $50,000 of debt for, with, a, uh, with, the gov with the tax office. And then me and my partner, we had two years of frugal. I wish I'd known about you back then. We had two <laughs> years of spending nothing, nothing at all. And I'm going to be honest and say it was one of the best couple of years of our lives because we just did a lot of nice stuff at home and we made more food and we played games and we didn't go out as much and it was quite wholesome. And then now things have recovered and I've changed a lot of, I've challenged a lot of those early attitudes. I've really worked on my financial literacy. Like I can't tell you how much I've worked on that. Now everything's much better, thank God. And I'm working on my future. Um, I don't want to be in a flat eaten by cats when I'm like 82. So I'm working on... Um, you don't like cats, I remember. I don't, I don't not one. like them, but I don't have one. So it'd be someone <laughs> else's cat, which is even more humiliating. No, I'm working on securing my future as a woman. I think that's especially important. It you is. Know, 
Um, and then also trying to create a little bit of generational wealth for my son, but also generational ed uh, financial education for my son. So my son is employed in my business. He gets a salary, he has a tax file number, and he does profit first to a degree. So he's allowed to keep half of what he earns, but the other half he has to save. And he's doing it. And uh, I feel that I wish someone had taught me that when I was little because they didn't. And <laughs> it caused me some problems. Well, I knew some of this and I didn't do it. But anyway, that's probably yeah, 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 yeah. So that's I true. Made, <laughs> most lots of mistakes as well. Kate, look, I have every confidence you are going to achieve amazing things with your financial goals. You already are with your business. And congratulations on your book, Six Figures in School Hours. It's doing super well. It's everywhere. It's in airports. It's in major bookstores. Where else is it? Is it a big W? It's on my site. Buy it from my site. Then I get all the money. No, I'm joking. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's in big W, which was a bit contentious. A few people were a bit weird about that, but I'm delighted because I think it means it's accessible to more people. And I'll be honest and say I did write the book because I really wanted to see it in an airport. That was my big life goal. I actually do think it's helpful. And I think I I was I floundered in those early years of having a kid and having a business. I was miserable. I made some bad mistakes. I burnt out. And if I can save someone from getting into that state, then I, I'll feel pretty marvellous, to be honest. I think you already are. So hit me with it one more time. Where can people find you so that they can follow you and know the fabulous things you do? Well, fantastically, I'm pretty good at SEO. So if you Google <laughs> six figures in school hours, you will find a plethora of bits and bobs, or you can go to katetoon.com and uh, explore all my various bits and bobs. That sounds weird, but you know what I mean. I do know what you mean. Anyway, thank you so much. It's just been such a delight. I've had so much fun chatting with you. So thank you very much. Thanks, Serena. What if we got together? You've been listening to The Joyful Frugalista with Serena Bird. And of course, sound has been by Neil Hadley. I would understand